right, good morning everyone. My name is Chris Daner and I work in the KSU Information Security Office on behalf of Kennesaw State University Information Technology Services. I'd like to welcome you to KSU's eighth annual Cybersecurity Awareness Day. Today we're at the Kennesaw campus on the second day of the event. Uh, yesterday at Marietta we had some amazing speakers as you can see here. Um, so we, and today we've got an equally uh, qualified and terrific batch of speakers to present on a wide range of information security topics. So if you'll indulge me for a moment though, uh, I would like to uh, give thanks to all of the people who made this event possible. Uh, it takes a lot of talented uh, and passionate people to pull off an event like this. So first off, uh, to our interim CIO, Lectra Longhorn, uh, her leadership and support has been critical for the success of this event. We're in our eighth year, guys, that's, that's pretty big. From University Information Technologies, Technology Services Enterprise System Services, I'd like to thank Chris Ward and Amos Williams and their web team uh, who developed cybersecurity.kennesaw.edu. Uh, I basically was emailing them practically every day with changes and they were gracious enough to do that for me, so they were fantastic. From University Information Technology Services Learning Technologies Training and Audiovisual Outreach, I'd like to thank uh, Matthew Lestar, Jeremy Waltz, and the entire broadcasting team for making the streaming of this event on uh, KSU TV possible. I'd also like to thank Thomas Dale, who's in charge of uh, UITS Communications, for helping with the marketing and communications of this event. Uh, he saved me countless hours of heartache and headache, so you know, Thomas, good guy. Uh, from the KSU Information Security Office, I'd like to thank all of uh, my team members. Stephen Gay, our CISO, Bill Moore, Chris Gaddis, Gary Harris, and Matt Sims. I'd like to thank our sponsors, Cisco and CDWG, for their generous support for the refreshments and speaker gifts. i uh, just let you know there's some wonderful refreshments in the room next door. I'd like to thank our speakers for agreeing to participate and share their knowledge and passion for information security. And last but not leastly, I'd like to thank all the participants everyone who's here in person and who's joining us on KSU TV. Uh, there are plenty of other things you could be doing, especially this early in the morning. It really means a lot to us that you've uh, come here to experience the event. So without further ado, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. John Eisenhower, our Chief Technology Officer, to come and deliver his keynote speech. Dr. Eisenhower has 33 years in information systems development, computer security, identity management, and privacy, high-performance computing, IP video surveillance systems, voice over internet protocol, networking, computed clusters for high availability in large areas including universities, public, private, and medical, libraries, and high energy physics. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm case you welcome to Dr. John Eisenhower. Okay, um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about the um, the evolution of computer security as I see it. I started getting interested in computer security around 1982. The university that I was working at then, I was a student, uh, got on the ARPANET. And it was really interesting to me because there was all these security people having very interesting conversations about what the future would hold and what was going on and, and security in general. Back then, the, the ARPANET was a fairly small town kind of feel and everybody knew everybody. Is there a okay, so, um, you know, you could, you could tell that into the SMTP port, PP port and then reconfigure it because half the time a lot of these nodes were broken. So there was a lot of trust that you could go in and reconfigure. What you would do is typically do is go in and fix it and then drop the system manager a note telling them what you did. So it's like, okay, your system is malfunctioning and I fixed it for you. Um, uh, around 85 is when I graduated and got into working um, with the universities. Um, and I was at the University of Louisville. Uh, we, we were on ARPANET because uh, Fort Knox had a Melnet line running real near us and they just let us onto it. So we were, we were on fairly early for some of the universities uh, of that size at least. And <clears throat> the stuff that I was aware of back then was mostly landline um, and you know, there wasn't you know, anything but dial up. And people, the kind of hacking that I was reading about then was that there was a thing called jackpotting. And what a person would do is you would, you would find an ATM teller, climb up the phone pole, 
and basically put a man in the middle so you were intercepting the stuff and then somebody would go around and then type stuff into the bank teller and then it would just make it spit out money until it ran out. So that was the kind of thing where it's like, okay, there's a guy on a telephone pole, a guy down there is fairly easy to, to catch and it's not really um, done over the network. Um, there, there were a lot of things like that that were done that you know, it was really just dial-up stuff and, and I started not trusting the banks around then. So what I did is I dialed up into my bank account and I had some money transferred without me authorizing it and I kept a record of it and I went to the bank manager and I said, how can this happen? He said, that can't happen. So they were basically in denial even back you know, in the 84, 85 time range that you could just basically move money around without them knowing about it. Um, at the time, there weren't any firewalls or IPS or basically not much stuff like that all in the, um, the EDU environments. We just hadn't gotten around to uh, needing it. Um, the mainframe environment that we had was where you would, you would dial in and it would log you in and then you could connect to different jobs so you could actually basically have a windowing environment from a terminal. And so once you logged in, it didn't ask for a password. You just kind of dialed up and it accepted your connection and then you connected to different accounts that had passwords. So what would happen is all the local high school kids would dial in and then you could chat with each other sideways and they would kind of laterally move around saying, hey, what's the password to this class until they could just infiltrate the system. And there wasn't a lot they could do and it didn't burn a lot of resources. So we pretty much just tolerated it. They were, they were exploring. And in fact, at that time, I think a lot of the hacking that was done the people saw themselves as heroes of the people and they were really exploring and that was back before hacker had a really bad connotation to it. And they really saw themselves as heroes. And one of the guys, back then you were, it was fairly romanticized. The, the guy that was our main systems administrator had broken into our mainframe and put his kits into the areas that were backed up. So as soon as they found out about it, they ended up having to flush the whole system. And when they were restored, he was back in. They finally just got so frustrated, they called the FBI and tapped his phone line, and that's how they caught him. And you know what they did? They hired him. Because back then, people knew that much more about security than you did. You better get them on your side. Most of the states didn't have laws that said, you know, it's like, wait a minute, you can't be breaking into computers. We just hadn't gotten around to that yet. Um, there was a guy that got into our system who ended up, the, um, the FBI climbed up uh, to his parents' house and went in the bedroom window and caught him in the act. Um, he wrote a book about it and got famous. It was Bill Landreth. Does anybody remember that? Um, anyway, so th this guy wrote his, he didn't go to jail, he, he got rich off of it. Um, the guy that I know that is our system manager didn't go to jail, he got a job out of it. And so there was a lot of things going on back then that as we were starting to emerge into the, the current environment, what, you know, it's like we don't, we don't hire people to let them write books anymore. Um, so uh, there's um, a video that I have from the, do you guys, everybody know SRI, Stanford Research Institute? They're really big into computer security. Back in 85, there was a guy that had been doing computer security for about 30 years. And I think it's really valuable to watch this and listen to him talk about the problems that they have and then think about what those problems are today, and then listen to him say, well, here's what's gonna happen in the future. So what I've seen in my realm is that we have the same problems, they just keep getting worse and worse. And the problem is the enemies, they form different camps. Like um, back in, the, in 85, China was not an issue. And, um, and you know, being attacked by a foreign country over the internet was not a big deal, you had local kids that were just kind of like, they were pirates and they were having fun with it. And nobody ever went to jail really unless you did something really evil and they weren't doing that kind of thing back then, they were just exploring and so they weren't punished all that much. And so there's that kind of group that I think ended up forming hacktivists and then the, um, the governments get involved and then organized crime gets involved. So you get this evolution where things go from relatively simple and, and easy to deal with to these very complex situations where we kind of built ourselves into a box because, you know, a system that says, oh, go ahead and tell that into my SMT port and fix my system is not exactly what we need in the current environment. So the thing was built with a small town where everybody left their keys in their car and the front doors unlocked. It was designed for that so we could all work together and then it kind of grew out of control. So, yeah, you want to um, start this video. It's, uh, this is really good vintage stuff and just listen for what the guy has to say 
about current problems and what he thinks is going to happen. It's an India to escape. Yeah. We have information handling to which we have grown accustomed, slows to a crawl. One might think that the protection of such essential and valuable resources would be routine and substantial. But this is not always the case. Recently, most of our time has been spent improving and expanding our systems, adding to their flexibility, making networks, and basically being more productive. The security aspects have often been overlooked. Additionally, good computer security often runs counter to making computers accessible, friendly, and easy to use. We'll find out more about the need for adequate computer security in the rest of the show. In the next segment, we'll meet one of the leading experts on computer crime. Now let's get back to the program. Our guest today is Don Parker from the Stanford Research Institute. Uh, he's a foremost uh, expert in computer crime. He's been working in the area for 30 years now. Um, Don, welcome to Computer Chronicles. It looks like with the widespread use of computers in society today that uh, we have a whole new high-tech uh, criminal. Can you tell us a little bit about the scope of this problem, computer crime? Yes, unfortunately we don't have any statistics on this computer crime problem. Therefore, we have to learn from it based on kind of a case-by-case -case approach. For instance, uh, in just the last four years, we have had the largest funds transfer fraud, $10.2 million. We had the largest in bank embezzlement, $21.3 million. We've had the largest securities fraud, $53 million. We've had the largest commodities fraud, $50 million. And the largest inventory fraud, $67 million. This is a, an indication that the more we are using computers, then the larger the losses potentially are, and we're certainly breaking a lot of crime records the more we use computers. So you think the escalation is a real problem right now? Yes, it's, uh, it really is an escalation because I think the, that uh, business crime is probably going down in incidents the more we use computers. But at the same time, when the loss does occur, it tends to be larger. Can you give some idea what uh, the characteristics of a, uh, a, cr a computer criminal is? What sort of individual you find doing this sort of thing? Well, we've interviewed about uh, 35 of these people so far, at least of the more sophisticated computer criminals. And we find that they tend to be uh, young, but then uh, people in the computer field generally are young anyway. They exhibit the Robin Hood syndrome, or it's a variation of Robin Hood. It's stealing from the rich and keeping it. But it's the idea that they differentiate very strongly in doing harm to people, which is highly immoral to them, and doing harm to organizations that they can easily rationalize. Not only that, they're doing it to a computer and the computer can't cry or hit back. And so uh, the computer is an ideal target for people who could not possibly come up and stick a gun in your face and steal money from you. That would be being a criminal. But when you can do it through a terminal or a computer, then it's an entirely different matter. These people do not, do not see themselves as, uh, as criminals. They see themselves as problem solvers. They have some intense unshareable problem that they're trying to solve. And they are in a position of trust, and they find that violating that trust is the easiest way to solve their problem. Don, are you talking about amateurs here, or, or kind of career computer criminals? So far, most of the problem has been from amateur white-collar criminals. However, now we're starting to see an, uh, an increasing number of what you might call career criminals. People whose uh, livelihood on a continuing basis is dependent on, on, uh, on crime. 
And you might expect that since for several years now, almost every major prison in the United States has been teaching data processing to the prisoners. So they do have an opportunity to learn the technology. And they're finding that they can't engage in their uh, traditional crime except in this new environment, this electronic environment. What are you, uh, Don, what are some of the techniques that people on use, criminals use to attack a uh, computer system? Well, we have about 1,100 cases in our research files at SRI now. And based on what we have studied over the past uh, 13 years, there are a number of, of uh, common techniques that are emerging. The most common one is we refer to as data diddling or false data entry. It's changing data before it goes into the computer, but relying on the computer to hide the evidence of the false data. We are also dealing with very sophisticated techniques such as Trojan horses, logic bombs, salami attacks, piggybacking, uh, data leakage, um, and super zapping, and so on. These are all of the technical or jargon terms for these techniques. Could you take one of those and explain, for example, Trojan horse seems to be a fairly explicit term. What, what, would, the, what would that mean? It seems to imply that there's something built into the program. Is that the case? That's right. The Trojan horse is one of the most fundamental criminal methods that has been used. And it is the idea of taking a program and building secret instructions into that program so when the program is executed in a protected domain in a computer system, it not only performs what it is supposed to do, but it also does the additional instructions as well. I say so this would be used to maybe put money into someone's account, an employee's account, or something like that. It could be used then for a whole variety of programmed frauds within a computer mm -hmm. system that might use a technique like a logic bomb, for example, where you have uh, programmed a branch instruction in a program so that when certain conditions for the fraud to occur uh, are, are optimal, then the time bomb or the logic bomb goes off and causes the crime to be perpetrated. There seems to be, uh, that seems to be a sort of an inside attack on a computer system when you put in a Trojan horse or a logic bomb or something like that. Now, we've seen an example earlier of a word use uh, where it was, uh, the system was attacked from the outside by attempting several passwords and, and uh, uh, systematically gaining entry to the system. Is that, is that something that actually has taken place uh, uh, where you try to go through a whole sequence of passwords and then you actually find out one that fits uh, and goes into the system? Yes, there's a whole uh, range of, uh, of malicious system hacking techniques to gain access from a remote terminal where the name of the game essentially is to impersonate an authorized user that is, you have to know the person's ID and uh, password to gain access. There is a scanning technique where you can automatically or sometimes manually simply scan telephone numbers, gain access to a computer, and then scan various possibilities of access codes and passwords to find or hit on one that then is um, uh, access to that system. How about user-friendly systems? They a helper they hinder in the, in the computer crime? Well, that's a, a part of the war that we're raging today. Uh, we all want our systems to be friendly. And unfortunately, a system being friendly is almost the opposite of its being secure. And so we're trying to balance, we're trying to find the balance between a friendly system and a secure system. Because the number of people who have this capability to access these systems is growing very rapidly. And so we have um, a, an enemy that is increasing in size, in its sophistication, and therefore we can no longer allow our systems to be as friendly as they have been. And what about the, uh, there's a, I guess we call a computerized community bulletin board uh, network that's grown up around uh, the whole technical hobbyist area. Uh, you talked about a pirate uh, version of this. Can you tell us a little bit about what one of these pirate bulletin boards would be like, and what the purpose is. Well, as you know, bulletin boards are extremely uh, uh, useful uh, uh, services in the computer field. But unfortunately, there are some of them that are set up, as you say, for malicious purposes, referred to as, as uh, pirate boards. In fact, in one listing I saw recently, we found 128 of these so-called pirate bulletin boards across mm -hmm. the country. They are used for intelligence purposes among malicious system hackers 
and they often will broadcast the uh, uh, telephone numbers of computers and any passwords that may be available and describe various protocols for logging on to other people's computer systems to engage in this unauthorized access to systems. Excuse me, Gary and Don. In a minute, I want to get to looking at some solutions to the kinds of problems you've been raising, Don, and we're going to do that in just a minute. Most of the discussion revolving around computer security deals with computer crime. There are, however, other accidents and conditions that we need to guard against. First, we must protect our computer operation from natural disasters such as fire, power outage, floods, and the like. Second, systems should be protected from the accidental destruction of data when someone unintentionally gains access, or if an incorrect terminal procedure is executed, or if a program accidentally destroys current data while modifying an operational program. We can't always prevent damage, but we can ensure continued operation by storing backup copies of programs and data files. Third, we need to take reasonable precautions to ensure that employees do not abuse their access to computers with excessive personal use. Fourth, we must protect our equipment from unauthorized use by outsiders. Good access control, including personal passwords, systems and log monitoring, separation of responsibilities, and external balancing controls are some of the procedures for guarding against intrusion. In the next segment, we'll hear from one of the foremost experts on computer security. So let's get back to the program. Don, you give us a good idea of what some of the uh, problems are related to computer crime, so why don't we take a few minutes and figure out what some of the solutions are. Uh, we have joining us also uh, Jim Holmes from TriData Corporation. Uh, Jim has a product that uh, helps us secure a dial-up system, so uh, maybe you tell us a little bit about the product. Certainly, I'd be delighted to. We've come up with one approach to be able to help secure dial-up networks. As you've discussed with Don previously, dial-up networks have the uh, requirement of dialing in and usually entering a log on and a password that the system itself requires. Now we've gone one step further and we've taken within a 212 modem type device, an auto dial modem that would reside on the front end of this processor, our timeshare system, you would place our device in and it has what we call an answer verification capability. We can go through and I'll give you an example of how we would store one. Let's say your name was Adam, we can put in your name and a password that we would use to access the system. So we enter AA for add and answer verification and then type in your name, Adam, and put a space in and then enter your unique password. And we can put in a password of anywhere from 1 to 250 characters. Typically the passwords that are used on systems are 5 or 6 characters. The longer the password, the tougher it would be for someone to break in. Now we found often people are trying to use 20 or 30 character passwords if they're really intent on trying to provide security for the dialing operation. Once we've entered the command here, we could go back and identify exactly who has access to the system from outside through dial-in ports by looking at a directory of answer verification routines. Upon receiving a call to the host computer where the system would be typically connected, we would go through and check for any of these given passwords. The passwords can be contained or controlled how many characters are received before the call would be disconnected. One of the problems that occurs in a lot of the dial-up systems is when you dial in, the system will repeatedly allow you to enter the password and it will come back and say error, re-enter password. With our device, after you've re-entered it once or twice, it will automatically disconnect the call, thus preventing someone from gaining access to the system. And that's the way we're controlling the answer portion of the dial-up environment. Now, in addition to that, there's also an originating portion which can be used to help control or secure networks. Many of the companies, the larger companies today and telephone operating companies are using our device because of the sophistication of being able to remotely configure passwords and log on procedures to their systems. By allowing them this remote configuration to the system, and that's done very simply, let me give you a demonstration. We would do AD for add a dial directory, we would put in a label, let's say we're going to call it uh, an accounts payable system, and we can put it in ACCT pay space, 
put in the telephone number of the system we want to call, and then space over and put in a password that would be sent to the system. And the password would just be stored by putting in a sequence of characters. Again, they can be entered from the local keyboard. Our unique portion of our system is that they can be downline loaded from a remote terminal or a remote computer. And by doing this, you can put in, again, from 1 to 250 character password. Now, the, do I understand this uh, correctly? Is that the basic idea is that if you dial into the computer system and then the computer system dials back to you again to verify that you're the actual person that you say you are, is that correct? Well, with our device, what we're doing is dialing into the system and entering a password. Once the password has been entered, at that point, you then have access to the computer system itself. Yeah, I think there's, a, there's another system here, I think the, the back is security system, which has a thing called DigiLink, in which, in fact, what happens is it's, uh, you have a salami technique, I call it the pizza defense, you know, where the pizza parlor calls you back to make sure you're the guy who ordered the pizza, where the host computer calls the dialer back uh, to make sure that the dialer was, in fact, the proper party to the request testing the services. Well, do they, these, uh, are these kinds of devices, do they really adequately secure data? What is your feeling about that? These devices uh, add another layer security and provide a significantly more secure computer system today than we have ever had in the past. However, we have to be aware that no computer system commercially available today is adequately secure relative to the value of the assets and the information assets uh, stored in them. Uh, therefore, we have to compensate for the technological uh, limitations in systems through operational, physical, procedural methods in order to make an organization secure that is using the computer. Don, we often look to the, the Japanese now for what they're doing in computers in general. Are the Japanese doing anything with regard to these security problems that we should be aware of? Well, the Japanese are a little bit behind in that they are, they haven't uh, experienced the kinds of computer crime that we have here in the United States, but they are just now starting to understand that. And, of course, they're trying to address uh, the U.S. market, where they don't quite understand uh, the, the criminal problems that we have in this country. Crime is a very cultural thing, and so it's quite different from one country or culture to another. Are the laws adequate right now in our country to deal with this very sophisticated form of crime? Well, the laws are improving a great deal. We have a long ways to go. We have 21 states that now have specific computer crime laws. And we have several bills in Congress that would, if passed, provide specific protection on a federal uh, nationwide basis. There's a, it seems like there's also a problem with uh, operating systems that become popular nowadays that, that the source is available to, to individuals. For example, Unix um, that has become widely used in commercial environments. So, what effect does that have on people that really can get at the source programs? Uh, um, have you seen any effect from that at all? We get a, a large operating systems like uh, the IBM operating systems that have years and years of security work. Uh, is a more popular operating systems now. What effect does that have? Well, Jackson's law says that with a big enough hammer you can break anything. And therefore, uh, any of these systems can be broken with a sufficient amount of work or skills, knowledge, and access. So it's a, a security is always a, a relative situation. And large computer programs are complex to the extent that they're not predictable. And if a program is not predictable, that is, if we don't know what it does under all circumstances, then we have to assume that it is not secure. Therefore, on a long-range research basis, we're aimed at developing the idea of a provably secure system where you could prove how it performs under all conditions and therefore gain some assurance that you have an adequately secure system. Don, uh, we have just about one minute left. I want to ask you, on a, we talked about war games earlier in the national defense area. How about economics? I mean, we have the banks now all tied to this massive electronic funds transfer system. What is the potential for a major economic disaster if the wrong guy got into that? Well, the, uh, the potential is uh, catastrophic. But the issue has to do with the risks involved. And we believe that security is advancing, along with advancing technology, and along with the increasing amount of money that is, uh, that 
is exposed in these large funds transfer systems. So that the risk is uh, relatively low today. But our major problem, however, is to make sure that the security, that the electronic fences built in these systems keeps up with that technology and with the amount of assets that become exposed in these systems. Real briefly, about 30 seconds left, what about cryptography? Is that a solution? Cryptography is the, is the most powerful safeguard, I think, that has ever been developed in protection of data through, com through communication lines and also as might be stored in computer media. However, uh, we don't have a problem to solve in that uh, area yet, the eavesdropping problem. However, in the future, it will become the most significant safeguard that we have. Gentlemen, we're out of time. Don Parker of SRI, thank you very much for joining us. Jim Holmes of tri -Hated. and I hope you'll be back with us again next time for another edition. Okay, so it, it's really interesting to me to watch what was going on um, back that long ago. Um, I, I would have edited out the tri data part, but I didn't have the ability to edit. But it did talk about the beginnings of two-factor authentication. That, you know, it's like, okay, six-letter passwords might not be good enough, and so how do we get around that? Um, so if, if you notice, it's like this guy said uh, between like 81 and 85, they had found 1,100 cases of computer crime. Most of the states didn't have laws against it. So they knew there was a problem, and they knew there was stuff that they needed to do about it. Um, um, part of this talked about where you could automate trying to log in because it, you, you'd dial in, hit it with a name, hit it with a password, and eventually it would hang up on you and you used to dial it back. Well, that's kind of the beginnings of a dictionary hack. You were just doing it over the phone line and it was incredibly slow, but back then you just kind of like leave the thing running overnight and see what happens. Um, they talked about um, that you could have uh, longer passwords. The guy said, you know, up to 200 something characters. That was the beginning of passphrases. And even in 85, they had that idea, but are we, you know, like how long before we effectively implement that kind of thing? Um, you know, and then the final thing that I thought was, well, okay, one other thing you mentioned was, um, you, you hear him talk about layers. They were starting to get the idea you cannot just have one barrier, you've got to have layered security. Is that something you've run across these days? Yeah, okay, and then finally when they mentioned encryption, he goes, well, yeah, we don't have encryption and nobody can sniff on anything, but it'll be probably the most important thing that can be done in the future. I think that that turned out to be pretty accurate. I think encrypting data in motion and at rest is probably the thing that we need to do. So I, it's really interesting to me to look at where we were, and this is like 31 years ago, and this guy had collected data over the past five years. He had been in the area for 30. Um, so it's really interesting to see that those same kinds of problems that they were talking about are ones we have not solved very well yet. So now if we fast forward um, about five years, I was working at the National Particle Accelerator Laboratory. Um, part of my job there was to manage NASA's network um, from uh, uh, Fermilab. And what we saw uh, there was, by then the network had developed a lot more, and we were seeing um, kids, particularly from Germany, and I'm pretty sure that from watching their behavior, they were kids. They would get into a machine, compromise one, move laterally into another one, and build kind of a string until they were deep inside the machine. And when you traced back, it just kept going backwards until you couldn't find them. Um, that made it a lot easier for them to hide uh, what they were doing. Uh, right around then, I was working with a guy named Cliffy Stahl. Um, he wrote a book um, called The Cuckoo's Egg. Has anybody heard of this? Um, this was over at, um, at the uh, Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory where he found like a two cent discrepancy in accounting and he said computers don't make those kind of errors. So he tracked back and then did the same kind of thing we were seeing at NASA. These kids were getting in these machines and hopping from machine to machine um, and then getting into the, uh, the end target that they want. There's a lot of that kind of stuff still going on. Um, I think that the Part of the problem is, is that we still have these same kinds of things. Can we, um, okay, so now let's move over to, um, to about 2001 and look at the kinds of, of hacking that are occurring. Um, the time period we were talking about, and even the experts were saying that, it was, it was fairly much amateurs, but it was becoming um, people that were doing it for profit. And you notice it's like, wow, we're training these people in prisons 
to become better criminals. I thought that was really interesting. I didn't know that until um, I, had, I had heard of that. Um, if you see what's happening, uh, vandalism and publicity, financial motivation and hacktivism, uh, the, the uh, advanced persistent threats, otherwise known as foreign governments, are starting to show up. Organized crime has showed up. And so as, as the whole thing gets more and more complex, we're not solving the problems we had 30 years ago, yet we're seeing an increase in, in what the uh, other side is doing. So here's a 10-year survey of data breaches. Uh, remember, he, he had seen um, between 81 and 85, he had seen 1,100. We're way past that now. And firewalls and applications, we're getting into next generation firewalls. Back then, we didn't really have firewalls at the educational level. Um, I can go, how are we doing for time? Uh, I think I'll, I'll, I'll probably wrap it up. I can get into how foreign governments are doing detection. I'll do that really quickly. Um, for instance, um, uh, yeah, one of the things that, um, that Kennesaw State did was we bought a hazardous chemical database. And the hazardous chemical database, people wanted to um, brag about it, so they put our name up as having purchased their product. And it was called Comatics. Well, if you're sitting over in China or someplace, um, you can say, well, I'm going to try and log into comatics.kennesaw.edu. Hey, guess what? It's saying you're there. So then you go ahead and launch an attack with an SSH brute force. And with the right kind of um, firewall, you can see anomalies that this kind of sticks out a little bit. Um, and then you can see where these attacks are coming from. So we're building better tools, but we have to have the authority to utilize them. When I talk to the Board of Regents and try and get them to say, you can block this kind of stuff at the front door of PeachNet, They're, they are completely paralyzed going, some professor or somebody's going to yell at me for blocking traffic. And one time we were getting, uh, we were getting attacks from somewhere. Um, no, it was Romania. Yeah, we were getting this really massive attack from Romania. I said, just go ahead and block the whole thing. I got, five minutes later, I got a call from a professor in Romania who was trying to teach a remote ed class. So I, I completely understand why there's concerns about that. But as these tools get better and saying, well, there's a brute force attack coming from a specific node in China trying to hack our system, we can block that kind of thing more and more decisively. But there's this built-in kind of fear of doing that for what's the penalty. So with that, I think that if you, if you think about where we were 30-something years ago and where we are, they, on the other side, have gotten split into different divisions. There's countries, organized crime, hacktivists, and the, the individual kids that are playing around. Now they just go to jail instead of getting, you know, writing books and getting famous. We haven't done much. If you, if you look, it's like, well, the, you know, the password, the two-factor authentication, the thing that we have done some is with encryption. But if you look at what they were complaining about and saying we need to fix, it's still stuff we need to fix. It's really kind of amazing. So are there any questions? Yes. That's a really good question. And, and I think it leads to the fact that you can improve technology, but you can't improve humans. Um, uh, I think SANS calls this securing the human. That's typically what they call it. And I think the only way to do that is through repetitive training and, and different kinds of drills. Um, a friend of mine does um, uh, um, security testing. And he'll take a bunch of pen drives that are infected um, and just throw them all around the place he's testing. And all they do is when they get plugged in, they call him and say, oh, this pen 
that was left at this location has just logged in. So somebody plugged it into a machine. So you need to train, and I was nervous about plugging my pen drive into this machine because it's like, you know, I'm just kind of like that. Um, so you can keep trying to train people, but I found that people have to get burned before they learn anything. And so, you know, it's like how, in, in the old days, when I, okay, in the old days of Kennesaw, I've been here like 15 years now, um, people used to go to websites and then they would get malware or they would respond to emails and get their self infected. People are learning not to respond to stuff like that, although it's getting more and more sophisticated. So I've even gotten emails where I was like really, it's like I was getting ready to click on that because it looked, it was so well crafted, it was aimed right at me, it was like, okay, it was something I was doing, it's like, how do you find this stuff out? So these advanced kinds of phishing and spear phishing attacks are really gonna trick the human. So the technology can get more and more sophisticated, but if you, you know, what's the saying, if you make an idiot-proof system, only idiots will use it. Um, you know, so constant training of the humans. Um, I was doing uh, cancer research and automating um, systems in, and I had this really nice little old admin lady who kept, you know, back then it was five and a quarter floppy inch drives, and she kept shoving the disk in between the two drives because there was enough of a gap there. And it's like, how can you train for that? You know, human beings are gonna make mistakes and the technology is not gonna be able to keep up with the inventiveness of humans making new mistakes they've never made before. So I think you put your finger on an intractable problem. Um, it's just, um, it's, a, it's a radar radar detector game. Sorry, that's kind of bleak, isn't it? <laughs> Okay. Part of the problem is the weak link. If you're if if you're being attacked, like a, um, a friend of mine, Carl Herberger, um, do, he defends like telcos and governments, which are apparently about the same size. Uh, and uh, he got called in to protect the Vatican, and he said it was like clockwork. It's like at eight o'clock in the morning, it's like everybody would go to work and attack the Vatican, and then at five o'clock they'd all go home. Um, so. What happens, in, in, uh, when I was talking with him about these really big environments, is your, your, in, your, your endpoint connectors get clogged up. And he's seen situations where, you know, they hit you so hard your firewall goes offline. And then all your other stuff goes offline because it just can't take the hammering. And so what his company does is go in and kind of parse some of the stuff out and they've got really big buffering equipment. But he's seen companies that said, look, this firewall is keeping us offline. You take the firewall out of the loop. And then all of a sudden they're really in trouble. So that's one. That's one of the things is, is um, you know, how do you how do you know who your neighbors are in the in the cloud environment? And you know, because it's like just, let's just say I, um, we put our email in a in a cloud environment, and the next door neighbor makes some some hacktivist mad. And all of a sudden, you know, our multi-tenant environment goes down because of something I didn't even have anything to do with. So is that kind of addressing what you're? Yeah, so that's a real issue, and we're just starting to address those. I tend to, you know, like, non-multi-tenancy is fairly expensive, but if you have multiple routes into your box, there's, there's technical ways of solving those kinds of technical issues. Um, how you avoid the social issue of looking like a bad guy that the hacktivists want to go after, or how do you um, look like you don't have a lot of money or some kind of religious preference or something so the Vatican gets attacked or the bank gets attacked. Um, I was at an IBM conference and the CIO for IBM was a target, right? I mean, he's the CIO at uh, IBM. His bank account got completely emptied out and disappeared into the void. And he should know what he's doing. Interesting times we live in. Yes. The video was clearly, you know, 30 years old. It, it, okay, <laughs> um, we, had, we had several ISOs back at the Board of Regents. Um, he had, he showed up in Pastebin, and it was for 
a security conference where you had a login, and had, we looked and it has his username and his password was SimplePass. Now, this is a guy that definitely knows better, and we're in modern times, right? I mean, this isn't 30 years ago when we only had six character passwords and you know to mix. I mean, the, the problem with me is if I'm trying to log in on a handheld device, I've got such a jumble of characters that I miss it a couple times. And one of the things they said before is that, you know, you could just keep hammering the system with this kind of kludgy dictionary hack. We've got it now set up, like uh, I was at um, another Big Ten university, and they had cranked it down to where three password misses and, you're, and then the account's disabled. Well, somebody wrote a script that went around to all the high-level admin accounts, hit it four times, and we walked in the morning and everything was broken. So, so your security becomes your vulnerability. And how do you deal with that? You know, it's like, I think personally, if I've missed it five times, I should give up. But I mean, three times with the level of passphrase that I'm using, sometimes I miss it a couple times, especially on a small keyboard. So we can automate that stuff, like with LastPass or something, but it's not really great for mobile. It's really good for um, desktops. So we can add technology to help with human problems, but the humans keep making the same mistakes over and over and over. And especially if this, you know, if the ISO at a major state entity is making password errors that of that magnitude, then it's like, you know, really, what are you going to do? Yes. I think that's a really good point. Um, I went through, um, during my graduate education, we talked about how a lot of times by the time you de develop and deploy a standard, it's obsolete. And if you look at um, what some of the, the later uh, 802.11 wireless protocols, they were waiting on ratification and it's like, okay, you guys are twirling your thumbs, we gotta sell this stuff. And so they're, they're releasing these things like AC, they were releasing it pre, um, before it was really um, uh, authorized or, or um, uh, made official. And so, on the one hand, if, uh, if we try and have a lockstep policy that forms a base, it's always going to be obsolete. And you can counter that by saying, well, okay, in my environment, we can form a consortia. Or if there's not enough consortia, here's what I've got to do. So I think that it's going to be like multiple layers. I think there's got to be a base layer where you don't do incredibly stupid things that are always going to be stupid. And then you have specific you know, uh, industries that say, look, we need to be way ahead of this, and we're not waiting on you guys to, to formalize a standard. We've got to do something about it. Um, the problem is that leads to um, uh, interoperability issues. Um, like, I, you see that with uh, identity and access management. You know, it's like you can have a bunch of different ones, but if everybody in the educational realm sticks with shibboleth or whatever, then you can have different ways of instantiating it, and it still works. So I think there may be some hope, but it's going to take a lot of smart minds and a lot of money to fix that kind of problem. Any other questions? Okay, great. Thanks, guys.